Welcome to Good Game, I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. This week on the show, we review the online multiplayer shooter Battleborn. And Hex, I noticed that CEO of Gearbox, Randy Pitchford, described this game quite well. So, if I may. <clears throat> it's an FPS hobby grade co op campaign, genre blended, multi mode, competitive esports, meta growth choice, and epic Battleborn choice Heroes game. game. Mm. But is it, Bajo? Oh, that hurt, whatever that was. Is that the century thing? <laughs> Also, we have a play with Steven's sausage roll. <laughs> Alright, we're going to try and not make any sexy jokes about that one. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Goose also fires off an IMO and Hingers goes to visit Australia's very first League of Legends gaming house. <laughs> so it's be like meat and two veg kind of thing. We want it to be the best we could be. I mean, this is the model that every successful team in the world has used. Now, just like most of you, we only just got our copies of Doom here in the Good Game office and we are itching to jump in and play, but that also means we won't have a review for you until next week. That's right. But for now, let's get on with the show. Can you name the game for this week? Looks like a hard one, Hex. Long and hard one. You've done that one already. Steven's Sausage Roll is a game about cooking sausages. Sounds easy enough, right? Wrong. Many have labelled this as the Dark Souls of puzzle games. Prepare to roll. The Steven's Sausage Roll is a fairly abstract game about this little fella with a big fork. I'm guessing he is Steven. He finds himself in this hub world surrounded by puzzles he can wander into, and each puzzle is full of giant sausages that need to be grilled to perfection. What a concept. The rules of cooking a sausage are simple. Just roll all sides of the sausage onto a grill and cook it evenly. But if a part of the sausage touches a grill twice, you'll burn it and fail. Once you've cooked all the sausages in the level, you're done and can move on to the next puzzle. The game never really explains that to you or anything, but you do figure it out pretty quickly. Yeah, and just be ready for that simplicity to be used against you in some of the most diabolically brain-bending puzzles ever devised. Yeah, this is very precise game design. So much so that, in fact, I would put this in the asshole genre. Mm. Every square of every level and every sausage and every grill is deliberately placed to make your head hurt. Asshole. Each move you make has to be carefully thought out. You'll find solutions come to you less from what I consider trial and error and more just constant error. <laughs> yeah, and unlike something like The Witness, you're not able to just puzzle it out on a piece of paper here. You really just have to experiment with which moves are actually possible, and as you eliminate all the wrong ones, the solution slowly starts to appear. But then it does lead to some of the most genuinely rewarding aha moments I've ever had. Yeah, if I didn't know that there were solutions to these puzzles, I would swear that some of them are actually impossible just by looking at them. And that struggle comes from a variety of mechanics. Steven's got very limited movement to get around these small levels, and he has to deal with a giant fork sticking out of his face, constantly getting in the way. He can move forward and backward and turn on the spot, but he can't strafe. So he needs to use the giant fork to shove sausages around from certain angles. But more often than not, that fork will make your life hell. I hate that fork so much. It can burn in a fire. Now I hate all forks. I just eat with spoons. The problem is it usually blocks you from turning or forces you to walk backwards or pushes your sausages into oblivion. Yeah, and the game is a troll too. Sometimes, even after you think you've solved a puzzle and the exit opens up, you realise there's no way for you to move to the exit without your fork destroying everything. <laughs> oh, I was so close! Luckily, it's got a very forgiving rewind mechanic. You just press one button and you can go back a step as many times as you want. Or just reset the puzzle instantly. And if you find yourself really stuck on a particular puzzle, you can back out into the overworld and try a different one. But you will need to clear every puzzle in the area before a sausage will appear to open up a path to a new area. So you can put off a tough puzzle, but eventually you're gonna have to confront it. It's masterful in the way that it layers on complexity and new twists to the formula. Like the fact that you can skewer sausages if you push them against something. But of course that comes fraught with its own new ways to fail. Yeah. You'll need to make sure there are objects in the world that you can use to help pull the sausage off your fork. 
Otherwise, if you skewer a sausage the wrong way, you'll never be able to get it off again. And for some reason, once you've skewered a sausage, you can't turn, but now you can strafe. <laughs> Come on, Stephen, just work with me, mate. We're just trying to make some sausages. Yeah, or how you find you can walk on top of sausages and move them around the place. But once you get on a sausage, you can get stuck in it forever if you don't have a platform with the right angle to step onto. Ah! It's genius, though. This is one of those rare games that you just can't help but be impressed by how much complexity they've got out of such a simple concept. Yeah, it's really clever, and it will make you feel amazingly stupid. I'm giving it four out of five. I think if you can finish this game, you should automatically be included in Mensa or be offered an internship at NASA or something like that. I absolutely respect this game's deviousness, and I never want to see it again. I'm giving it four out of five. This week, I want to talk about review scores, because in my opinion, some of you take them way too seriously. Now, this is something I've thought for a while, and working in an environment like Good Game, it's a topic that comes up a lot. The team regularly argue over questions like, what score should a game get? Should reviews be out of 100? What's really the difference between a 4 and a 4.5? But I wanted to talk about it now since there was a bit of controversy that kicked off from IGN's Lucy O'Brien giving Uncharted 4 a preliminary score of 8.8 .8 out of 10 in her review in progress. Some thought that this was cause for alarm, it was a bad score, it was a wrong score, it wasn't the score the game deserved. The comments section exploded with fury and wrath at the injustice of it all. Disappointed! And all this from people who obviously hadn't even played the game yet because it wasn't out. They just decided from trailers or other reviews or whatever else, they just knew in their little uncharted loving hearts that 8.8 .8 wasn't right. But why did they think that? Well, other games, supposedly worse games, got better scores than 8.8, .8, some said. Or well, some latched on to the scandalous fact that Lucy was a woman. It's a woman. <gasps> I don't know. Oh, a woman. I'm scared. It's just madness that people take this sort of thing so personally. They legitimately get angry and toxic about it just because in their mind someone has an informed opinion that slightly differs from their completely made up and preconceived notion of what number should be assigned to something. 17? No, 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 17. 18? No, no, you got a 14 now. Alright, I'll give you 14. 14? Are you joking? And sure, I get that games mean a lot to a lot of people. They mean a lot to me. And far be it from me to belittle the importance of game reviews. For many, they help decide what few games they may decide to ever purchase. But if you actually read her review, you'd see that she still loved the game. She wrote a fair, thorough review and gave it a placeholder score that she felt it deserved. And that's her right to do so as an experienced game reviewer. I think what's more concerning is that people seem to think there is a clear right score for a game. As if reviews should all be some scientifically distilled, completely objective, robotic analysis with little to no concern for personal opinion and taste. What is my purpose? You pass butter. Oh my god. And while any reviewer worth their salt will do their best to take an objective lens to a game and analyse it fairly from an informed viewpoint, a review and any subsequent score is still always going to be someone's opinion. And as consumers of gaming media, we get the choice of aligning ourselves with reviewers and personalities that we feel share similar opinions and tastes as us. So next time you play a game, ask yourself that given the chance to score the game for IGN or us or whoever else, what score would you give it? But more importantly, would you then be able to argue that your arbitrary number based on your gut feeling and your life experience of gaming is the one true score? Of course not, because there is no right or wrong score. When you boil it down, the score itself is an instinct. It's a feeling. It's the vibe and, uh, no, that's it, it's the vibe. And even if you think you could, someone else is always going to say you're wrong. But that's the world we live in. Not everyone agrees about everything, and it's healthy to have discussion and debate about differing opinions. Heck, I actually love seeing a score I don't agree with because it either forces me to reaffirm my own feeling about a game or in some cases it can challenge my reasoning altogether, and that's awesome. What's important is that I don't take it personally, and I'm not a dick about it. You're a dick. You're a dick. You're a dick. You're a dick. At the end of the day, no score is ever going to hinder my own personal experience and enjoyment of a game. But that's just my opinion. How do you react when a game score doesn't match your own opinion? Should it even matter what score a game gets? Let us know on social media, and we'll discuss it on tomorrow's episode of Pocket. Thanks, Goose.
Man, it's a tough thing scoring a game, isn't it? Mm. You know, we even made the decision to change our scoring system from out of 10 to out of five, because we were never scoring games ones or twos out of 10. It just sounded too harsh somehow, whereas out of five, it averages out better. Yeah, it feels nicer. But then, like, if you drop the score and go down that games can't be scored because there are some of many different <laughs> arty parts, people just think you haven't played the game. That's true. <laughs> well, now it's time to enter the world of professional esports. Mm, sounds like we need our resident esports expert on the scene. Summon the Higgers! Professional esports houses are dedicated spaces for esports players to live and train together as a team. And over the past few years, they've exploded in popularity globally. League of Legends players at Team Legacy have recently set up Australia's first official gaming house. So I went to find out what it's like. Why have you done this? We wanted to be the best we could be. I mean, this is the model that every successful team in the world has used. Anecdotally, from everything we've seen, every best team is in a house. Why is that, do you think? It gives you that kind of that social aspect. It's a lot easier to bond with your team. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the time with eSports, you meet people online, and it, it's not really the same as when you're face-to-face -face with them. At any point of the day, if I have an idea, I'm able to, t to tell somebody, I'm able to show somebody, or we can play together. Take us through a day in this team house, then. What are you guys up to? You know, we live where we work, and that's kind of a, a strange dynamic. It's, it's hard to relax sometimes, so we try really hard to kind of define the week. 2 p.m. we start training, and we usually do a two to five block of um, friendlies versus another team, and we'll just kind of fit as many games as we can to that three hour block. All review will happen outside of that time, so that will usually happen uh, in the next three hour block, which is review time, but also kind of free time. You know, we have dinner, some of us go to the gym. And then eight, we start again, and we do another three hour block from eight till 11 and then mandated hours are finished. Yep. But m most players would play solo queue, they would play on their own and- um, Do streaming know, and stuff like that. Streaming, yeah. So in individually, we, we only mandate like six or seven hours of team practice, but I would easily do closer to 12. Have you noticed an improvement in your play since you moved into the house? Significantly. Um, so last year we kind of had an up and down season where we just managed to kind of get second at the end and then um, managed to get to the grand final where we lost. Um, but this, this year, we've been undefeated. So uh, I've seen massive improvements. No time in only three months that we've been here. Or well, in fact, even after the first month of being in here, we were 10 times better than we were when we came in. I can't believe I... The team attributes some of their improvement to the weekly sessions with this guy, sports psychologist Mike Martin. Why would an esports team need a sports psychologist? These are some of the best. And so because they're some of the best, that also means that there's pressure, there's their own expectations about performing well, there's outside expectations on them. So there's a lot of psychological pressure on them to continue to perform at that high level. And then I want you to slowly make a fist and notice what happens with your knuckles. Notice the change in colour. So that, in, in any other traditional sporting arena, would require psychological support and input. And so that's what's happening here, that this eSports team have made that decision to, to support their players and to help them perform at their peak on a consistent basis. The camera's going loud and loud, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, honestly, I sometimes look at the crowd if I'm on stage, because it just takes me out of it. But if I'm... But yeah, I think that would work well for me. Cool. If I was just to reset. It's such a mental game. And so if you're, if you're having issues mentally that are distracting you from being able to think as clearly as you would otherwise, that, that, that's massively detrimental. They're in a gaming house, say, utilising sports psychologists. This is a team that is very much together right now and they look unstoppable. This is the first time you've ever lived out of home before. So there's got to be a lot of new experiences. Are there things that were surprising you at all? I definitely thought it would be different than your traditional like moving out of house. You're essentially living in a house with your teammates, your friends, and you're playing video games as a job. It's getting to a point where we're just trying to like learn all the strengths and weaknesses about living together. But um, I think it's going well. Things when we first came in, you know, a lot of these guys never lived out of home before and very few, uh, you know, practical life skills. So um, it's been a pretty steep learning curve in, tr in trying to, you know, uh, show everybody how to do how to do basic things that uh, you know otherwise their parents would have done I, I assume you know but they, they they're learning and, and it gets easier every week. I had an assumption of like if I lived with them what it'd be like, and I mean some of it they lived up to, but some of it was quite like interesting. Like um, what? I'll give you an example. Like <laughs> I mean Tim, um, he um, constantly just uses the bathroom with the door open, 
and like it's fine like that's I guess that's what he does but it's just it's not fine <laughs> like close the door please what would you say to people who want to be in your position if you're good you will get noticed and you will get invited to join the pro scene you know as a beginner it's very difficult and you're going to need to invest a lot of time and a lot of hard work into being as good as you can be and in the end that might still not be good enough Man, that is bleak. That said, for those who do make it, it's the best. I love it. We all love it. We're having the best time ever. And so if you can get involved, absolutely get involved. Even if it's not, especially if it's not as a player. You can be a coach. You can be an analyst. You can just help out, you know, in, in any aspect. Esports is an amazing industry with a lot of really great people. And, and, and it's a lot of fun. But yeah, just pre be prepared to work hard. We're all here because we really enjoy the job. We think of it as a career that we really want to continue going through. It's hard to say if this will continue, but I think all of us really want it to continue and we're really make, trying to make sure that this year really is successful for us and gives us further reason to continue doing this journey. So, Hingers, you actually stayed overnight in the house with the team while you were there. What was that like? Oh, it was really intense. And you can see how this is going to kind of affect their gameplay and also is going to be a model that other teams in Australian esports are going to copy. Is it kind of like the LAN parties of old that I remember in my childhood? Just a really fun thing that goes on forever? <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of. But, like, no LAN party is fun after, like, the 14-hour mark, you know? <laughs> it just becomes this, yeah. this kind of never-ending perpetual doom. Uh, so they had to have a lot of rules to like structure their entire lives, you know, to stop it from becoming that. Would you do it again though? I can't imagine they'd invite me back, to be honest. <laughs> what did you do? We can never speak about it again. Following their hugely successful Borderlands franchise, Gearbox have thrown a new offering into the team-based shooter arena. It's Battleborn and it's pure chaos. We can die. Everyone in the other team is like super high level. <laughs> Plus, Hingis thinks this is StarCraft. Guys, are we playing StarCraft? <laughs> <laughs> Where are we heading? What's the goal? B? Yeah, no. yeah keep uh, busy at B. I've got C. Uh, I'm not going to be able to hold A. I'm going to need a hand. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ah, die! Iron <laughs> muscle. <laughs> I'm ending this! Oh, it's so. Oh, f yes! <laughs> <laughs> Help, 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 I'm Jackman, Jackman, totally... Jackman. Oh, no, I'm totally pissed. Sword guy needs to die. Where are you going? Sword guy, sword guy, sword guy, got it, got it, got it, behind you. Oh, I'm gonna kill this mushroom guy, so good. <laughs> I did not kill him good. No, 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 we're trapped. <laughs> someone, can someone stay on uh, B? Yep, I'll, stay I'll go to A and distract them. Oh, I'm about to die on B though. I'm gonna die on B. A hero. A hero! Battleborn sits comfortably between the shooter and MOBA genres. Yeah, with a hint of tower defence thrown in just to confuse you. It has a cooperative story mode to play through where you team up with friends. This is the man. Or you can battle it out in versus mode matches that are chock full of MOBA DNA. Unattended minions make easy targets. Watch over them. Too deep! Well, before we get into it, let's talk about the look of the game because it's definitely reminiscent of that wild Borderlands animation, but it's also quite unique, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's cartoony and all over the shop. I'm just not sure if I like it, Hex. Even now, I'm not sure if I'm on board with the look of this whole game. Yeah, I mean, well, art is subjective and purely on the art alone, I like it. I was thrown by those strange 2D hand-drawn animation cutscenes, but it's a callback to a very specific animation style that was popular in the 90s. And I actually thought it was kind of badass. It is a little jarring to jump back into rendered 3D after that, but it also fits the erratic nature of this whole game and its mishmash of crazy characters. Anybody? Shut up, please. I could not reach for that skip button quick enough, Hex. What a swag of nonsense all those cutscenes were. And look, I know Borderlands is a very different type of game, but I felt that was really cohesive in the way they built that world. And this just wanted a bit more direction and focus to the construction of this world. But how much that matters to you will depend how much you care about that in a multiplayer online game. I agree the writing and the world building maybe isn't as strong as it was in Borderlands, but I also think the diversity of the characters here are a real strength. I mean, just look at this. Tiny bird in a mech suit. Mushroom ninja. Starring Nick Boy as Miko. Hawkman. 
Yeah, there's great balance and diversity in female characters too. A well-designed and varied lineup with everything from this awesome trooper to a girl in a ball gown with an alarming number of swords at her disposal. Oh, she was not fun to come up against on the battlefield. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh no, she's back! She's back! She's back! And she's healing herself! And I'm dead. Not at all. But they have nailed this character roster, haven't they? And from what we've unlocked so far, all these characters do really play differently. And that's no small achievement when you have a roster of this size. There's a great mix of close-range melee characters. Yes! Snipers. Mid-range shooters. And healers to fill out your party. <laughs> that. <laughs> I got way too close to the big sentry. <laughs> I had some success with close range characters like Shane and Orox, who are a duo of girl and demon hybrid that have some nasty claws. Die, 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 die! <laughs> But I find myself better suited to the sniper classes, like Thorn. One shoe, one problem. <laughs> <laughs> A kind of Russian space elf archer. I can't move. Sniper's at the back, guys. I am trying to get him. Or Marquis, the fanciest, dandiest droid in the universe. <laughs> You're so funny to look at, Steph. I know. I'm so fancy. I love the way he runs. Yeah, and it's humiliating being taken out by him too because he seems to mock you with his jaunty prancing. Before I talk about my favourite character, I want to talk about the one I hate the most, and it's bloody Montana with his <laughs> stupid tiny head and big body. What do you think of that? What do you think of that budget? I'm in a menu. I can't even see it. Oh. And his, his gesture. How do I gesture? Press G. So stupid. It looks, oh, the way he turns around. I hate um, it. Turns I, around. It looks like I think it's adorable. He whittles a small character out of wood. I hate him. I hate do you just him. hate him because he's big and muscly? Is that what you hate? He has a tiny head. So stupid. He has a very small head. It's, it's upsetting. I find it upsetting. But I love Wrath. He's great for sneaking up behind opponents and unleashing melee hell. I am killing Spider Girl, she is dead! Nice. Characters have two abilities to start with, which can be upgraded throughout each match in the game's helix tree. It basically gives you two options to choose from as you level to boost your abilities. Nobody will care, because they'll be dead too! With a third, more powerful skill that unlocks further into the match. Try and... Let's kill, let's see if I can kill this guy. Until next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was never gonna survive, but I thought it would be fun. It adds a whole new layer of intensity when that final ability unlocks. I love this unlock tree design. Although you're upgrading at the worst possible time in the middle of combat, so it's tempting just to pick one and go for it without realizing what it's actually gonna do. It does mean every character has lots of different options for each different mode that you're playing. Collecting in-game credits will also allow you to buy additional stat boost options. You put these in pre-made loadouts, and then you buy those upgrades throughout the match as well. Shoot shards. Gain the monies. I'm just over here oh, doing resource management, guys. <laughs> I was surprised at how much customizing there actually is to do for your playstyle. Yeah, but I also like the system of spending these shards on traps and turrets and drones too. All right, turret building time. Do not fear the dark. There's so much to try and coordinate within each mode, isn't there? Yeah. Usually an objective like taking down enemy sentries while protecting your own. You mad, bro? Setting up good defenses. This will not stand. And trying to coordinate attacks on enemy players. As soon as a match starts, everyone kind of just scurries. Yeah, I would say that we are terrible at this game, that we're really crap and we need to work on our teamwork. Final score, zero to 100. That's pretty so, awesome, you guys. Great job. <laughs> we didn't get a close. point. Not even a point. <laughs> it was close. Yeah, we were not very successful at all. Guys, I killed someone. <laughs> I was actually surprised at just how much strategy there is to this. He <laughs> crit. <laughs> Players with some serious LOL or Dota 2 chops will be at an advantage here because there is a lot about some of these modes that call back to those games. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it wouldn't feel like a MOBA if you weren't getting destroyed time and time again when you first start playing, to the point where you start questioning if you're good at anything in life in general. Oh god, this is so nerve-wracking. There is also a capture the point mode, which again we failed to work together very well on, but it's actually quite exciting to play. 
<laughs> yes, die! <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have, I have, um, be on the way. Even though it's not exactly a new concept. Yeah, although the tower defense elements like turrets and heal prods really help set this mode apart. Hex, this mode took me right back to the Arathi Basin days and wow, you know, picking the right characters to hold down different points, using your abilities to survive as long as possible until help arrives. I'm ninjaing A, I got this. Collector go, go, go B, go And B. I think this was actually my favourite mode because it made me want to get better at the game. I could see where I needed to improve and I think that's a great sign for a competitive shooter. As for the co-op story mode, I'm glad they've included it, Hex, but I don't think I like them enough to play them all more than once. Dudes. The story mode missions play out a little bit more like an MMO raid. They're a bit wave modey, and at times I just felt like they went on a little bit too long. Just uh, firing arrows and everything. Yeah, it wasn't always clear what you were meant to be doing in some of them. And also it felt like a few glitched out We had to wait for ages for the next event to trigger. Were we supposed to trigger something, maybe? Or was it just bug? Like I can see at the top there's something versus something, so there must be somewhere. Yeah, I think amidst the chaos of a game like this, you need some pretty straightforward direction. Still, it's nice working towards a common goal cooperatively without the stress of enemy players as a bit of a break from the versus modes. He's down, he's down, he's dead, he's dead. Yes! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get any of it. <laughs> and unlocking more characters as you progress through the story missions is good motivation. How did you find the maps? I think strategically, from a design point of view, they were excellent, but I found the look of them all to be, I don't know, just a little bland. I didn't really care about the zones. Oh, okay. I disagree with that. Oh, I think the design of the world is as vibrant and diverse as the characters themselves and really reflect the different parts of the universe they've come from. That said, and again, I don't want to draw comparisons to Borderlands because I know they're completely different games, but like you said, the world there felt so much more fleshed out, whereas this just feels a lot more gamey. It looks like, um, who are the guys that aren't Terran and Zerg? Protoss. It's like a Protoss base. This doesn't mm. look anything like Protoss. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look anything like Protoss. There is a lot this game gets right, and yet it still manages to be just a bit forgettable for me. It's kind of like a really intense sugar rush that you come down from and then struggle to motivate yourself to get back into. Yeah, yeah I, I, for me it's the price point. It's in that $90 to $100 price range, and I just think that's a little bit too much for a multiplayer shooter, especially for a new IP. You know, these games are only as strong as their community, and if you don't have that following already, that's a tricky place to start pricing your game at. Yeah, I mean, I guess for people who do latch onto this, you can potentially get a lot of hours out of a game like this, and that is certainly justification of price for a lot of people. So, you know, I don't think that's necessarily an issue. What's it coming? Final thoughts? Well, I had fun with this, but there is a lot of competition out there for this kind of game at the moment, and I'm not sure that Battleborn is going to be leading the charge. I'm giving it three out of five. This is a solid and strategic shooter, and all the groundwork is there. We had no lag issues or any connection issues, so that was all fine. Hey, I'm a bit wait and see with this one, Hex. I'm going to give it three out of five as well. So guy die! Oh man, this is hectic! Shane and Oryx, team detectives! So, did you name the game for this week? It was Samba de Amigo on the Wii. Originally released for the Dreamcast back in 1999, this rhythm music game used maraca-shaped controllers and challenged you to shake along to a mix of Latin music. And it's our name the game because the Wii version was developed by Gearbox Software, the same team behind this week's Battleborn. A slight detour for them, Hanks. Yeah. Next week, will it be worth the wait? We face the hordes of hell in Doom. And it's a bit of an FPS special because we'll also fight against an evil empire in Homefront the Revolution. Hex, looks like I'm gonna have to reinforce the A and D keys on my keyboard with all that sick circle strafing I'm gonna do next week. Mm, yeah, now you may want to tune into Spawn Point on ABC3 this weekend because we're gonna have a creepy human worm wrestle and push me pull you. <laughs> Well, until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Find you out. You excited for Doom? I am. I remember that as being like one of the first games that legit scared me as a kid. Yeah, I remember the sound design being really terrifying. Those beholders, it sounded like they were always behind you, but you turned around and they weren't yeah. behind you. Yeah, terrifying. And then they were. Yeah.